With that, we can get started. My name is Eric Fulton. I am the National Program Manager for Customer Outreach and Communication in PBS's Office of Portfolio Management and Customer Engagement, coming to you live from GSA headquarters in Washington, D.C. So I'm going to be your host for today's presentation, where we are going to address Mick Jones's eternal question, should I stay or should I go? Can't say for sure if the clash we're referring to lease space in the United States federal, federal government agencies, but stranger things have happened. We have two presenters today who are going to walk us through the lease analysis tool, the GSA resource, that helps guide our decision making to present you, our customers, with the best procurement strategies to meet your new workplace requirements. Our presenters today are Julie Hepp and Garrett Gordon. Julie works in GSA's Office of Leasing in the Center for Lease Policy, Delegations, and <clears throat> Contract Administration. Julie has been with GSA for almost 37 years, starting in 1982 as a Realty Specialist Intern in Region 3 out of Philadelphia. Before coming to the Central Office, Julie served as Region 3's Lease Policy and Compliance Specialist and Acting Lease Acquisition Officer. Garrett works in GSA's National Office of Leasing in the Center for Lease Project Delivery. And Garrett has been with uh, GSA for about 15 years now, starting in 2003 as a Realty Specialist intern as well, but he was in Region 7, which is in Fort Worth, Texas. So prior to his time with Central Office, Garrett served in a number of uh, positions here in PBS, including Planning Manager, Regional Account Manager, and he's held multiple supervisory and senior positions in the Region Leasing Division. So before we get started, I do want to go over just a couple of quick housekeeping uh, notes here. We have automatically muted all of the audio today. That helps us better just control the sound quality of the presentation. Uh, if you're joining us by telephone, you can follow along with the presentation slides that were emailed out to you yesterday. If you don't have a copy or you need a copy, you can say so in the chat or email client series at gsa.gov, and we will get you a copy out as soon as we can. If you have a question for any of our presenters about the subject matter today, feel free to use the chat pane that you just said hello to me there. Uh, what we will do is compile the questions. We'll answer them the best we can in the chat, and some of them we will take directly and ask our subject matter experts over the course of the presentation. Any questions that we don't get to, we're going to compile, archive, turn them around into a uh, formal Frequently Asked Questions Q&A document, and we will send that back to you following the presentation today. Uh, part of our presentation will be a demonstration of the tool, and if you'd like to maximize your screen to make the most of uh, the, the display, what you'd want to do is hit that four-headed arrow at the top right of your display area. That's going to maximize the presentation screen, minimize the chat, and give you the best view of our tool. If you have a question and want to return to the chat pane, just hit that four-headed arrow one more time, and it will magically reappear. Uh, before we get started, I do want to uh, make one quick plug. This uh, topic is going to be one of many topics that are going to be featured next month at our PBS Customer Forum event. It's on Thursday, June 6th in Washington, D.C., here at GSA headquarters. So if you're in the D.C. area or if you have some travel funds to get here, uh, we encourage you to learn a little bit more and attend this free event, in-person uh, networking, education, uh, it's a good time. We've got about 200 folks signed up so far, and a whole host of GSA subject matter experts will be on hand. You can learn more online at www.gsa.gov slash pbsforum. I'm looking at the attendee pane. We've got uh, several hundred customers here. I am sure, Julie, that their indecision is bugging them. So, diga uh, me, Julie, should we stay or should we go? I'll turn the presentation over to you. All right, thanks, Eric. So this is Garrett. So I'll introduce the, the first slide here. And uh, according to Google, I'm supposed to start out a presentation with a good joke. Uh, but I'm not a very funny person, so instead we're just going to read FAR clauses to you very slowly and methodically for at least an hour and a half as we go through this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Um, so we'll, we'll do our best to keep it light and uh, not overly boring, but there are, there are a few unfortunate FAR sites that we want to make sure that you guys are aware of, kind of guiding policy for us for leasing. Uh, so we've got a few goals we want to talk about other than full and open competition by first defining what full and open competition is, and that's uh, we'll get into that in the next couple of slides, and then give you guys some talking points and some insight on reasons that we're able to uh, justify going other than full and open competition in hopes of getting succeeding leases. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about and show you some screenshots of our succeeding lease tool. We've got a, we've kind of made some improvements to it here recently, and want to make sure and 
talk to you guys through those. So Julie, I'll hand it over to you at this point. Thanks, Garrett. I really appreciate it. So, all righty. So we know you thought you were going to talk about succeeding leases, but we thought we would uh, set up the context to talk about the flip side, which is competition. So we want to set the context about the requirements for context of competition and the regulatory context about why we need to seek competitive actions. Now, GSA, we work into, in leasing, we work under the regulatory authority of GSAM 570. And I'm going to give you some policy. Sorry, I'm trying not to bore you. I honestly, I'm sorry about that, but I'm a policy geek. This is, the, this is the world I work in, but we'll try not to be too boring. And Garrett is so much more interesting than I am, so apologize right now. But I'm going to give you a few, a few um, slides here that talk about policy, but we'll try not to get too boring. But what we say here under GSAM is this. Unless the contracting officer uses simplified procedures, the competition requirements of FAR Part 6 apply to the acquisition of leasehold interest in real property. So what it says is, look, you got to go to the FAR, you got to go FAR part, part 6, and it says you got to go competitive. So we're going to go to the FAR, we're going to talk about and see what FAR 6 says about, about competition. So going to the next slide, FAR Part, FAR part, FAR part 6, Federal Acquisition Federal Acquisition Regulations Part 6, it says this. Now, we're going to read the whole thing, but there's two things I want you to look at. And it basically says, the contracting officer shall promote and provide for full and open competition. Now, we're going to talk about that full and open competition in a bit. Those are regulatory buzzwords that we'll kind of get to over and over again. But the nice thing in Part B you're going to see is, it says, yes, we have to provide for full and open competition, but it does give us a little bit of wiggle room here. It says, look, it says that are best suited to the circumstances of the contract action and consistent with the need to fulfill the government's requirements efficiently. So you can see there's some openings here. Yes, we have to have full and open competition, but we have some ability to think about circumstances of the contract action and consistent for efficient requirements and efficient, comp efficient um, competition. So you can see there's some wiggle room here. So we're going to talk about efficient competitions. We're going to talk about efficient procurements. So now, what do we mean by full and open competition? Well, FAR defines that as all responsible sources are permitted to compete. So that's what we follow when we mean by full and open competition. So let's go on to the next slide, and let's talk about what are we talking about. Now, why are we talking about competition here? Why are we pushing, why is GSA here pushing competition in leasing? Now, yes, it's required under the Competition and Contracting Act, SECA. Now, if you've been on many projects with GSA, I'm sure many of contracting officers talk to you about SECA. Well, we've got to do it because of SECA, which has been around since 1984. Um, yes, we have to do it. Um, but it's more than just, yes, we have to do it. From a practical perspective, there's a good reasons why we think competition is a good idea. It increases the government's negotiation leverage. There's less reliance on a single offeror. When that lesser knows that they have to compete, there's a good chance we're going to get better rental rates. When you have a full and vigorous and rigorous competition, they have that incentive to give you their best offer. But in addition to that, there's a chance for better improved space solutions. You know, get a chance for you to meet those improved utilization rates, you know, reduce the footprint. Maybe that building will have a, a better, uh, more efficient common area factor, maybe better column spacing. Uh, maybe there's a better building out there. Maybe that building out there that we haven't seen out there will have a nicer common areas, nicer window line. Maybe there's a chance for better economic catalyst initiatives. Maybe that space will have better transportation infrastructure or better amenities. Who knows, maybe we're just used to the same old building that we've been into. So maybe there's a better mousetrap out there. So there, there may be a reason that a competitive procurement is a better solution. So it's not just because we're required to do, that, do it. There may be good reasons to seek a competitive action. OK, next slide, Garrett. So what are the elements for full and open competition? Well, these are the four elements that makes an action full and open. There's sufficient information about that requirement that's made known to the public. The intent to procure 
by full and open is made known to the public. Those requirements that you have are not unduly restrictive of the competition, and all interested parties are invited to compete. Now, in the next slide, I'm going to go into it and explain it more from a leasing perspective. So from a leasing perspective, this is what I mean. Next slide, Garrett. So from a leasing perspective, what I'm saying is GSA must advertise in the Federal Business Opportunities website, FedBizOps, without using restrictive or succeeding lease language. And we advertise what your requirements are. We're very clear about how much space you need. Those requirements, they can't be unduly restrictive. So they have to be supportive of, by the agency mission, your mission. And they have to be consistently applied. They're not arbitrary. And our request for lease proposals, RRP, must be issued to all interested parties. So what do I mean by they can't be unduly restrictive, these requirements? So for example, we know some of our agencies, they have like co-location restrictions. They can't be arbitrary. Uh, they have to be supported by, by your agency mission. So that's what I mean by these have to be um, supported by your mission. They can't be arbitrarily replied. So that's the case for competition. But again, that's kind of not what we're here. We know we're here to talk about succeeding leases. And well, let's talk about succeeding leases. I made the case, hopefully, for why GSA pushes for competition and why the government pushes for competition and why that's for the default. But we want about succeeding leases. And we're allowed to do succeeding leases, and succeeding leases can be a good thing. But what are succeeding leases exactly? So Leasing Desk Guide Chapter 5 talks about succeeding leases and gives us a definition. Now, this is a long definition in the chapter, and I won't read it all to you. But I've highlighted some things that I want you to focus on. A succeeding lease secures a long or intermediate term continuing occupancy at the current premises at the end of the lease term. So basically, it's mid to immediate term. It's not short term. It's at the current location, and it happens right when the lease expires. And what it's also saying is, in order to secure the succeeding lease, unless you, the agency, has a mission reason to stay at that location, if we find alternate locations, we have to do a cost-benefit analysis in order to determine whether that succeeding lease is in the best interest of the government. And that's what it's saying. And that's the definition of a succeeding lease. So moving to the next slide, what's our authority to do a succeeding lease? Because technically, a succeeding lease is a sole source action. And as I said before, competition is a default in our procurement. So in order to do a succeeding lease, which is an other than full and open or auto procurement, we have to have the authority to do that. And the authority for that is under GSAM 570 in order to do a succeeding lease with the incumbent or current lessor. Because again, this is a non-competitive procurement. So we look again to GSAM because GSA leasing, GSA leases authority is all under GSAM 570. And so there are two conditions under which we can do a succeeding lease. The first one is whether we can't find any potential locations. And that happens, but not really a lot. But more often, it's we find acceptable locations, but we do a cost-benefit analysis. And that cost-benefit analysis indicates that the award to an offeror, other than the present lessor, will result in substantial relocation costs or duplication of costs to the government, and the government cannot expect to recover the costs through the competition. And that's the magic buzzwords, and we'll be talking about that a lot through the presentation. Now, succeeding leases have benefits. They can save money. And as I said before, the whole idea of doing this cost-benefit analysis is it's evidence or predicted by this cost-benefit analysis that it will save us money by doing this succeeding lease. We do this because we presume that the competition cannot possibly expect to give us a deal better than the current lessor can give us through this competition. That's why we do succeeding leases. We also feel they can save time and money for the government and the private industry. They're an efficient procurement mechanism. 
And we don't want the competition to be spending time and effort to go for a deal they can't possibly win. That's why we want to do a succeeding lease. We also know that it can reduce project impact for you, your employees, and for your clients. But we know that they're not risk-free. They're not a guarantee. And what do I mean by that? They have pitfalls. First of all, the incumbent lesser has less incentive to negotiate, especially when they know there's no other competition out there to drive those rates down. These other than full and open competition procurements, they can sometimes fail. Now, when I say fail, I mean we don't reach a deal on a fair and reasonable rental rate. We don't come to an agreement as to a good rental rate on behalf of the government. And when that happens, that means we have to go means we have to go back to the drawing board and then start a new full and open procurement, which then requires an extension at your current location or maybe another temporary action, taking more time and resources. And that means we've lost our leverage because now that lesser knows, okay, you didn't do a deal with us. That means you've got to go out in the street again. You've lost all that time. You're going back doing again, again, you've lost a lot of that competitive leverage. Again, they're not a guarantee. There's benefits, but there's pitfalls. Now, what is the justification for doing this? We go back to the FAR under the Competition and Contracting Act. There are two reasons that we can do an other than full and open. FAR 6.302-1 and 6.302-2. Almost always it's this first, it's the former, not the latter. And the former one is only one responsible source. And no other supplies or services will satisfy the agency requirements. In other words, no other responsible source. Now, as I mentioned before, sometimes it's mission-based reason. That's pretty rare. That's for our colleagues, PSA, who have to be on the airport to keep us safe. Um, they have a mission-based reason to be on the airport. Most of the time, it's usually, again, this duplication of costs. It's that cost-benefit analysis. That's what's going to support the succeeding lease for, uh, justification. That's going to support the succeeding lease determination. The other one, unusual and compelling urgency, that's for your emergency leases. Those are for your FEMA disaster leases. We don't do those very often. Those actions are limited to one year in length at most. So that for many reasons, that's one, that's one of the reasons why we generally don't do uh, justifications under that statute. So generally, you find yourselves doing it under the one, uh, only one responsible source justification. So who makes this decision? Well, you as a customer have a very important role to make in this. You provide us the requirements. The requirements need to be accurate. They need to be timely. We need that leverage. The sooner we go out on the street, the sooner we make this decision, the better our leverage is, the better is the chance that we're going to make this procurement decision quickly and accurately. We need the feedback on the current location and making this due diligence decision, which Garrett's going to talk about later on when we talk about the analysis tool. We need to know about this lesser's past performance. How well are they taking care of you? How well are they taking care of this space? What improvements do you need at this space? What needs to be done to take care in terms of the paint and carpet? What needs to be done in terms of the common area maintenance? What is the roof leaking? Um, are the elevators working? What, are, what about the hot and cold call? Are they taking care of that? Another thing we may need from you is what kind of, uh, what kind of space build out do you need? We may need some of that cost information, maybe uh, move and replication costs. If you have that kind of data, that will be very helpful as we do these cost-benefit analysis. So any of that information you can give to us as part of this due diligence, as part of this cost-benefit analysis will be extremely helpful as we, as we make these um, decisions. But at the end of the day, it will be that GSA, lease contracting officer, who will control that procurement strategy. We're the ones who control the procurement and doing this uh, justification, doing this cost-benefit analysis, making a decision about whether this is a competitive action or a sole source action is the purview of GSA 
and the purview of the Leaf Contracting Officer. But again, it's important to recognize that you as a customer do have an important role to play in giving us this information to make this a successful procurement. How is this decision made? And this is going to key over to um, what Garrett's going to talk about. Again, the key is this cost-benefit analysis. Again, we look at this, whether the substantial duplication of costs is not going to be expected to re be recovered through competition, and that's documented through this cost-benefit analysis. And we have this tool, the succeeding lease analysis tool, and we do this in two phases. We do this early on using a rough order of magnitude, and that's done at the requirements development phase when we're doing our, when we're doing our analysis to decide is it a competitive action or is it going to be a sole source action when we're, when we're doing that sort of early analytical decision making. And then we do a formal cost benefit analysis. Once we've made that early decision, we're going to do a formal cost benefit analysis and that's going to be with a justification that's going to be approved by the competition advocate. So there's two different times we're going to do this cost benefit analysis. And, and Garrett's going to explain the difference between them and how that's used. And I am going to look and see if we have any questions at this stage before I uh, turn it over to Garrett and we're going to talk about the analysis tool. We, we do. Thanks for checking. We do have a couple of questions. I think it's a good, good time to pause and uh, collect ourselves. Going back to a phrase you used a couple of times, the uh, mission-based reason. We had a customer ask, you know, what constitutes a mission-based reason? Uh, and I'll sort of add to that, like, who, who makes that determination if something is mission-based or not? Is that, is that GSA? Is that a customer? Is it a mutual decision? That's a real good question. I think it is, at the end of the day, I kind of always say that, in one sense, client controls the mission. You know what I mean? It's just like the delineated area, things like that. Client, client knows the mission better than anybody. Who knows their mission better than the client, correct? The client explains the mission. They do the mission. They perform the mission. So the client would explain how the mission ties into um, why they have to be at that building. Because again, this has to do with soliciting one vendor, one incumbent, and that's associated with the building. So the client makes the tie into why that building and only that building works. And so they would make, they would tie that in, they would explain why this mission is tied to that particular building. GSA would look at that and would decide whether that makes sense. We would, we would have to analyze that if you, if you would understand that. And we would say, yes, that makes perfect sense. We would, that from a rational perspective, uh, that would that would that would that would hold water and and that just because that justification would still have to be submitted to the competition advocate so we would still have to do a formal justification and that would have to be subject to approval by again either the the competition advocate or the regional or the national depending on how high this uh, this this justification would have to be sent through so the the client would send that information and we would look at it and we would you know would analyze it and see if we would feel that that would be um, reasonable, if that makes yeah, sense. So this is Garrett. It, it, uh, let me jump in for a minute, too. I think you gave the perfect example earlier, which was uh, TSA on an airport. Obviously, their mission is to protect the airport, so there's a portion of their space that has to be on airport. Uh, but And so that, that mission-based justification is kind of the site that we typically use for TSA ones. Uh, however, outside of that, you know, the, the one we get commonly is, that, hey, we have a mission-based reason to be in this building because we've been in this building for the last 20 years. We're a public-facing agency, and everybody knows we're in this building. That's not a mission-based justification. That's, uh, you know, we can absolutely change those uh, addresses, and we can update websites and everything else. I know it's not comfortable, uh, but that's not typically a good enough justification. Another example would be a, a group that, that works closely with DOD and needs to be on a DOD base. That's usually a no-brainer. Uh, there's some other kind of odd, odd mission-based re reasons to uh, stay in a particular location, and typically those are situations like on-airport deals. They're pretty rare. rare. I mean, they, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are very rare because again, you're talking about a lease building, and you kind of why would a lease building have to be within a particular lease location? It's just, it's just very, very rare. Mm -hmm. Agree. Mm -hmm. 
I got a couple questions actually about succeeding leases uh, we can sort of take together. I think they might be related, um, something sort of near and dear to what many of us are working on at uh, GSA, and that is uh, reducing square footage in lease terms. So what influence does uh, a different additional terms uh, options have on a succeeding lease? And a similar question, uh, can you do a succeeding lease but for reduced space, reduced square footage? Uh, I don't know about Julie, the additional terms, but, but yes, go ahead, Garrett. I was going to say, I, I, can, uh, I can address the first part. If there's, if there's option terms in an existing lease, those are typically renewal options or something of that nature. Uh, that's actually not a separate procurement. So we would we would analyze those renewal options, determine whether or not they're fair and reasonable. If they are fair and reasonable, we would execute those renewal options. That's actually not a new procurement in most cases. Uh, there's some oddities of that, but I'll save everybody from that pain. So then the, the um, second question was, can space be reduced on a succeeding lease? And I believe the answer is absolutely yes. Yes, yes. The only kind of question is, is what, once you um, what, once you start the Making changes and reducing the square footage, then it then it kind of gets to more does that does that mess up your cost benefit analysis? Because once you start reducing the square footage, and you have to start then rearranging your space, and then you start having to invest in that space and doing reconfiguration. Now you start having to expend money in your in your build out. Then that may affect your cost benefit analysis, and you go, oh, now I can spend money at my current location. Now the the the, the now I'm not too sure I can. I can recover the cost of competition. So those are the things that go into the cost-benefit analysis. So that's the reason why, once you start reducing your space, is this exceeding lease necessarily in the best interest of the government? So all that kind of goes into the, into the, into the calculations, into the analysis. I agree. But, yeah. But, but, but yes, you. But yes, you can reduce. Right. It's, and it's it's most simple when you can you know vacate one floor and then occupy floor. your remaining space with no changes other than paint and carpet. That makes it pretty easy. Yes. Uh, but like Julie was describing, when you do a reduction in space and you've got to tear off space and you have to be able to give up marketable space, which is difficult to do as well, and then rebuild secure perimeter walls and all these other situations, there's a lot of nuances to that question. Yeah. But the short answer so we, is yes. If you start absolutely. creating skips and stuff and then, you know, all bets and swing space and all, all bets are off when you start doing that. So it depends. But, yes, in terms of reducing from a pure theoretical perspective, you can reduce and it can still be considered a succeeding rate. All right. Um, let's, let's take one more question before we move on to the next part of the presentation. We have a customer asking, I, I don't know if this is ripped from the headlines or not, uh, but a customer is asking <laughs> how they can secure a, uh, a lower lease rate when it appears the owner is unwilling to put the terms down in writing, but then asks uh, an interesting question, can a new lease be written where for two or three years, the remaining years of the current lease, the rate is higher, and then the, the reduced rate is the, the years following that. Does that make sense, if you can do something like that, or does everything have to be same flat rate every year for the lease? I think we probably need to table that one for now. It seems like a, a fairly nuanced question that we probably need to give some thought sure. to, a, to give a real proper answer on. Yeah. That sounds like a plan to me. And I think that is a good time for us to switch over to the second part of the presentation. But uh, keep popping those questions into the chat pane, and we'll pull some out, answer some in the chat as we can. Thank you. All right, thanks, guys. Uh, so this is where I get to take over and bore you guys for the rest of the time. Um, what we're going to talk about here is the succeeding, superseding lease tool. Now, this is nothing earth-shatteringly new or special. We've added a, a, a rough order magnitude section to it that makes a gives us the ability to do a quick glance early on in a project when requirements are kind of known but kind of not really known. Uh, and so that gives us a better track on the procurement and also on the requirements development process. So this tool, I guess it's some side notes up front, is that we absolutely have to have customer input on this to make it successful. I'll show you and I'll highlight those couple areas uh, as we go through it. Um, it's also in that second section, the formal cost-benefit analysis, what you really need to know about that is it's, it's very manual. We've kind of standardized the way that our cost-benefit analysis are looking uh, and the way they're intended to look, that therefore, our justification for other than full and open competition, which I'll shorten to JOTVOC or OPVO. Uh, when those go up the chain and they have to go up all the way to the commissioner in some cases, depending on the value of the lease, uh, those cost-benefit analysis are all going to look the same. But the the short, the short run is, is that the rough order magnitude tool, uh, we're, it'll be most successful when we get good input from the customer agency. So we'll, we'll dive into that. 
Uh, so first we're going to look at the ROM tool. Um, this is just a simple screenshot of it, and this is not the entire thing. Uh, a quick note up front is that this, the rough order magnitude tool, the way that it works is, is it, it references uh, market data that GSA pays for, and we're not allowed to share outside of our agency based on our contracts with those agencies. So unfortunately, we can't send you a live version of the tool, but in every case that we run one of these rough order magnitude analysis or formal analysis for one of your projects, We've got a button in there. We click customer report. Uh, that's what you're seeing on your screen. It's identical to the one that the, that the planning manager or the contracting officer is going to use to justify these things. And so it, what you're seeing here is identical to what we use internally. And what the customer report provides is that it provides the kind of, it's, I'll call it a stripped version, but it, it doesn't have the proprietary, proprietary data that we're not allowed to share outside of our agency attached to it. Uh, so it's not live anymore, but you can go through and you can see everything, all the analysis, all the numbers that, that we produce in there. Uh, so let me zoom in on a couple areas and show you guys what we're looking at here. Um, so what the planning manager or project manager or contracting officer is going to do is they're going to go in here and remember this is rough order magnitude. This is meant to take 10, maybe 15 minutes uh, once you're actually in here working on it. Uh, they're going to go in. They're going to put in the square footage. They're going to drop in your AB code. That's going to give them their the, uh, TI allowance tier. And then you simply select the Reese market and submarket that the space is currently located in, and then the CBRE market and submarket that the space is currently located in, and it'll automatically produce rates that are expected in that market. Uh, then we go over to the alternate location. We put in the square footage that we could go in the alternate, alternate location, which could be different than the incumbent location, depending on a few variables. Um, and then we put our delineated area more or less in there by choosing different resub submarkets. And so in this, in this particular example, um, you know, they're currently in downtown San Diego, but we, uh, you know, we assume that they could have a broader delineated area. We add La Jolla and Mission Valley in, uh, which one's more expensive, one's cheaper than the downtown area, just for example purposes. Same thing with CBRE markets. We do a larger delineated area there. Hey, Garrett, this is Eric. I just want to check yes. in real quick. A couple people are, are asking if you can make the screen bigger. I know that this is sort of a demo tool. I just want to remind everyone, uh, you can hit the four-headed arrow at the top right of your display screen. Hopefully you can see it there, and that will maximize your display area. Uh, if you have a question in the chat for the chat, you can just hit that again, and the chat pane will pop back up. That might uh, allow you a little bit more room to uh, see the tool that Garrett is doing here. Perfect. Yeah, and hopefully these zoom in parts are uh, helping with that a little bit. I, I noticed some of those chats before I started zooming in here. So, um, and what's, yeah, you guys can get the presentation afterwards, and we can send out a, this example version in the customer report so you guys can, can mess with it as well. Uh, so the more, in, the more detailed portion of this um, is to the tenant improvement section. So in the current location, we basically have a checklist of yes, no's. Uh, so typically in your current location, if we're looking to do a succeeding lease, uh, you're going to tell us, we need paint and carpet. So we simply check yes in the areas. This is based on a national estimate, uh, independent government estimate, and then we, we localize it uh, to your given market using the LCI adjustment there at the top. Uh, so we would go through, we would select the, the things that you'd like to change in the space. Usually paint and carpet is a decent example. If there's some known unique TI cost, uh, we have the ability to add that in down at the bottom. Say you needed a giant rolling file system or you wanted to build a skiff in the space, uh, something of that nature that we could, we could do a, a quick estimate on. We could add that in. And then for the alternate location, this is probably the highlight, the most important number that goes in this, this rough order magnitude tool uh, is the agency TI cost per foot. Uh, and this is the hardest thing for us to acquire uh, right now. So we absolutely need customer input to help determine this number. Uh, I know that some agencies really closely track what, they, what they've spent on recent build-outs and recent uh, you know, moves and, and relocations. And so that information is really key for us to have an accurate uh, rough order magnitude tool. Uh, we're working on a, a few things to improve that, improve our ability to, to grab that number for you guys. But as of right now, it's uh, pretty challenging. So we want to make sure that that, that number is realistic uh, both in GSA's eyes and also in, in your eyes as a customer. So uh, we have that national cost average. We add that number as multiplied by times square footage comes up with a rough order magnitude estimate on what it would cost us to move. Uh, then we've got known unique TI costs. We have a few lines there that, once again, if you know you've got a skiff 
um, we can add in a cost or an expected cost for that. If you know you have some other kind of unique build out that's not really captured in your national average, we can add in some cost for that. Uh, then we drop down to the move cost section, uh, and it's a simple yes or no, and then it's based on estimates, uh, national estimates that GSA has done. And then there's also some known unique move or personal property costs. You know, if, if um, alternate location, we're going to have new furniture, we know it's going to cost $150,000. Uh, some other examples like that that, you know, these are, once again, the rough order magnitude, they're expected to be big round numbers, uh, and we really rely heavily on our customers for that information. So let's drop down to the bottom half. So this is still the rough order magnitude tool. Uh, so there's a section in here, it's just rates and data factors, and so the TI amortization rate, uh, you know, it's defaulted to 8%, but it can be whatever it needs to be in any given area. Uh, common area factor is generally 1.15, and so the most important piece here that's, a, that's adjustable is the lease term, both full term and firm term. And so we would put that in there, and basically what that's doing is uh, it's calculating the number of payments, so it's amortizing out the TI costs that, that we said we needed in a given area. So this is just the alternate section. Uh, for the most part, the term mirrors, we have to compare the same term at both, both places. Uh, but if the common area factor or the, the expected amortization rate's a little bit different, we have the ability to adjust that. And so then what it does is it goes down and it calculates the total cost for both locations, and then it compares those two. Uh, so if the incumbent location, as in this example, if the incumbent location is, is expected to be less expensive than an alternate location, uh, as we can see here, this one, uh, it's about a $1.1 million cheaper to stay in place than it is to move at rough order magnitude. Um, we would take that into account. So in this case, it's showing a 15% savings. Uh, now this is kind of a point of contention and it's not a hard and fast rule, but we want to bring this up. Remember the GCM 570 says substantial duplication of cost. So, so generally speaking, we're looking for about a 20% factor at rough order magnitude to really lean hard towards taking the next step. Uh, it's not a hard and fast rule. And there's, once again, it's rough order magnitude. And so the, the main reason that we're looking for 20% or more is just based on kind of the variability or the general inaccuracy of a rough order magnitude estimate. So that's why we look for a pretty substantial cost difference. Uh, but that's, once again, it's not a hard and fast rule. That's just what we're looking for. So what would the normal case would take place here is that a planning manager would be working with you guys, the customers, to go through this and to work through this and to develop this rough order magnitude estimate if succeed, if doing a succeeding lease is something that, you know, you all are interested in. Um, and so then it would produce this output after you guys fine-tune the information. And then if it's a substantial, if it looks like substantial savings, then that information would be presented to the leasing team and the lease contract officer would review it and, uh, you know, give consideration to say, hey, should we take this further down the succeeding path? Or do we think that we would be more successful in a procurement and getting the best, best deal for the taxpayer by going full and open competition? And just because we go full and open competition doesn't mean that you won't be able to stay in place. I want to make sure that everybody's clear on that too. Um, so now we'll talk about the formal cost benefit analysis. And so it's, all this really is, is a, it's, a, it's a spreadsheet that has formulas behind it. Uh, the contracting officer is going to be the one in charge of doing the formal analysis. And so this would be at rough order magnitude, we say, hey, yep, it looks like we've got good, good potential savings here, so let's develop our requirements based on the succeeding lease. And then it would get handed over to the leasing team, and the leasing team would take that a step further. So what they're looking for in the formal analysis is, is that we're going to actually, we're going to call uh, buildings that are listed on the market, give them some basic information about who we are and what we're looking for, and ask them for some prices, just some example prices or some, you know, some ballpark ideas. We're going to call them and talk with the incumbent lessor and say, hey, give, give me your best rate. I'm doing an analysis, I'm looking, and I'm trying to see if this is worth justifying. Give me your best rate. And uh, so this is going to be based on detailed independent government estimates that are conducted by the contracting officer on the leasing side and by some of our support staff to develop these uh, TI costs and whatnot. But you see it's very manual. The green cells are the ones that the CO is going to input information into. And they're inputting the shell rate for each and every year based on how many years the term's set for. They're inputting the operating rate, and then that's being escalated at 2.5% uh, or whatever they think is a, a good amount to adjust it by. 
and then we're doing the same thing. Uh, well, excuse me, in the tenant improvements for the current location, uh, we're going to get a, a detailed scope of work in working with you. Uh, we're going to do an independent government estimate based on that scope of work. Uh-oh. Sorry, guys. Hang on. Hit the wrong button. My apologies. Stand by just one second. While we're getting back up to speed, I just want to encourage everyone to keep uh, putting those questions into the chat. We are seeing some uh, customer and situational specific questions, which um, I think we're going to compile at the end and put a little more uh, dedicated thought into responding to. Um, but uh, if you have any sort of more, more generic or open-ended questions, we're going to be asking our panelists later today. And then we'll also be turning all the questions around into a Q&A doc for you. And that will also be posted on our website, www.gsa.gov slash CES. Thanks for filling in for me after I pushed the wrong button. My apologies there. Uh, so tenant improvements, we're going to develop detailed scope of work uh, with, you know, from you guys, the customers. And then we're going to do an independent government estimate based on that scope of work to get our best estimate as to what we think that will cost to stay in place. Uh, we're going to do the same thing for the alternate location, based on the information we have, we'll be looking at, you know, what uh, we'll, we'll need a detailed scope of work for both, for both places. Uh, and so we'll do an analysis and an independent government estimate based on what we think it would cost to move. And then we input all that information and then it, it's going to spit out the, the associated savings or the expected savings. So you see, once we get to the formal analysis, the, the percentage difference is gone. And that's because, once again, it's all up to the contracting officer and what they feel is appropriate and reasonable. Uh, but we are looking for substantial cost savings to staying in place, uh, one that we don't think can be recouped by competition. Uh, so once we go through all this, this work and we're, we're even considering furniture and move costs and even some other miscellaneous costs, uh, we're, we're trying to get a very good picture of the overall procurement and all the costs associated with it. Then the contracting officer is going to use that number to make a decision and either use that number in a justification for other than full and open competition and send that through the appropriate chains to get, you know, to get signed off on by all the different authorities that are necessary. It's, it's not just the um, contracting officer in most cases. And uh, then so that would go forward and then we would seek to, we would start a succeeding lease procurement at that point or other than full and open competition procurement. or uh, they're going to go through this, and they're going to say, hey, the, the costs just really aren't substantial enough, and uh, we need to go full and open competition. And once again, there's, n there's no guarantee at that point that we can keep you guys in the same location, but there's absolutely uh, nothing that would prevent you from staying in the same location as well. So let me see. Kind of talk through that. Okay, so then the third piece of this... Uh, the succeeding lease tool is this other consideration section. I'm just going to quickly go to go through this, but it's basically it's it's all the qualitative aspects, the non-quantitative things that we that we consider when we're looking at staying in place. The last thing we want to do is uh, write a new 10 or 20 year lease for you guys in a building that isn't isn't in good shape or that you all aren't happy in, or that has some kind of major issues that haven't been dealt with appropriately. So we look at uh, anything from ABAS security fire to environmental and then even tenant satisfaction survey result, results too. Um, and then we talk to our field offices to make sure that, you know, from their perspective, everything's looking good and working well. And then we have a list of questions that the agencies should be asked at some point during the formal analysis. Um, you know, we're, we're looking through and we're just trying to really consider all the different quantitative factors, or excuse me, qualitative factors that could come into play here. And this list isn't exhaustive, but it's, a, it's a, meant to be a minimum here. Um, wanted to remind you guys, so what you just saw, those screenshots that you just saw was actually a customer report. So that is the, it, it's identical in looks to what GSA uses. But uh, once again, we can't share our live tool with you guys just based on our contracts right now. Uh, so we want to be the ones that, that run it for you, and our contracting officers are the ones that ultimately make the decisions for you as well, or for the procurement, excuse me. So just a quick wrap-up. Um, 
you know, remember we've got a lot of regulations that Julie told you about, and uh, she was actually really kind. She didn't read the FAR to you guys quite as much as uh, I would vote for. But, uh, you know, full and, full and open competition is our default. Uh, and then we've got the ability to do succeeding lease procurements uh, when the LCO thinks that we've got, you know, good enough information and good enough detail and a substantial enough cost. 95% uh, of the time they're based on a cost benefit analysis uh, using the FAR and GSAM sites that Julie provided earlier. Um, they're not risk-free though. Uh, when, we, when we go out doing an other than full and open competition, in most cases the lessor knows that they're the only game in town. And so because of that, they're going for exceptionally high rates and that's usually what causes the problem is that we have a we have an incumbent lessor that's just being absolutely unfair in the rates that they're offering. And so that, you know, when we run into that, that brick wall, we, um, we typically end up going out full and open competition and forcing them, forcing everybody to negotiate if they want to keep us as a tenant. Um, and then just wanted to reiterate, you know, you all's input in the rough order magnitude tool and also the formal cost benefit analysis is extremely extremely important to us. Uh, we're getting that number for the average or estimated uh, cost to build out space elsewhere, that's really important to us. And so we want to we want to make sure that we're working closely together with you all to, to track and to obtain that information. So we've got a couple close out slides, key terms. I'm not going to read through those. Um, when you guys download the presentation, there's some links to some of the material that we cited, the FAR and the GSAM. I know that's some great bedtime reading. Uh, and then also the GSA leasing desk guide. It goes into even more detail than we've gone into uh, here for succeeding leases or for other than sole and open competition procurements. So that is all. Well, and you'll I never guess, but we questions. do have some questions. <laughs> yeah, no, I, we, we, we do have quite a few questions. Um, okay. the, the first one that you covered, and you might want to go back, I think it's two slides. Obviously, uh, everybody wants a copy of the tool, and I think you, you explained, you know, that, that the tool is not something that's shareable, but that, can you talk about what outputs and what outcomes a customer will see other than the tool itself, just to, to cover that one more time? Sure. So, uh, let me blaze back to the slides here. I'm sorry for the craziness. Um, so, when... And I guess, once again, our, our default is full and open competition. So unless a customer is advocating and, and asking, saying, hey, I, I want, you know, we want to consider doing a succeeding lease procurement. We, we really like where we're at. It works perfectly for us. Uh, all we need is paint and carpet. Uh, when they're talking with their planning manager, that, that conversation can be had, and the planning manager should have the ability to run a rough order magnitude. So what, when the planning manager runs that, what you'll see is exactly what's here on your screen between, between these couple slides. And of course, I've got all these uh, up. So th this is the top half of the screen. I just, I literally took screenshots of a customer report for this particular one. Uh, and so that's what you'll see. So you'll get to see all the numbers that we used. Uh, and it'll be in Excel format, so you can, you can play with the numbers a little bit, uh, but there's no formulas behind it. And then most importantly, the information, the, the, res the market data that we pay for uh, that we're not allowed to share outside of our agency will will be removed from that. But you'll still get to see the numbers that we use for your particular deal. If that if that answers that question enough. I, I you know sh short short of sitting over your shoulder and watching you do it, I think that is a a fine enough answer to be honest with you. Uh, but we have some more questions just about how the the tool operates and um, how many months prior to uh, a lease expiration are the various estimates done, the ROM and the detailed. So that, that's a great question too. So generally speaking, we're looking to have all of our requirements and kind of our everything set and moving forward towards procurement by 36 months out. So it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of between 36 and 48 months that you'll be contacted um, about these. And remember, you know, we're always focused on the expiration date of our leases, but there's we have we typically have pretty lengthy soft terms in most of our leases too. Uh, so we can, you know, w once we're in that soft term, we've got the ability to kind of renegotiate some things and work on some things. So uh, 36 or 48 months, three or four years may seem like a long time in advance of an expiration, but when GSA has to go full and open competition, it, 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 it takes an unfortunately long amount of time to go out and do it the formal FAR and GSAM way. 
uh, which is which is what you know GSA is required to do. So we've we've kind of set up for worst case scenario where we have to go where we have to go full and open competition. Uh, worst case scenario is not the right term to use there, but uh, typical scenario where we have to go full and open competition. So we we need those requirements, and we'll typically this will be run. I'd say between 36 and 48, or even down to 30 to 48 months out. Great. Um, and can you clarify? Is this um, is it is this done in all instances? Is this something a customer can request to be done? What's the the process for this? It's absolutely not done in all instances. Uh, so this is this is something that uh, you know in talking with your planning manager early on when you're setting out all the. The requirements for your deal. Uh, if this is something, once again, if, if the customer is happy, if, if everything's working great in the current location, uh, and we've, you know, we're, there's things look like a succeeding lease would be effective, then this is certainly something that can be requested. And running the rough water magnitude tool should, you know, it, getting the numbers to put in it takes some time, uh, so it's not super easy. But once once you've got those challenging numbers to acquire. You know, setting out market rates and looking around and, and taking a quick uh, taking a quick look at it uh, that that shouldn't take too long to do. Um, I guess one more thing to mention just on that note: if, if we know if we know the incumbent, if we happen to have information early on in the project, if if we know the incumbent, like it, say our say the market is thirty five dollars and our current lease is forty, uh, we we should assume that the lessor is not exactly going to be excited about going down to the, get back to the market. And they're going to try and charge us 40 or even more than that. Um, our planning managers, our contracting officers, and our project managers have the ability to override the incumbent rate uh, to something that we feel is more realistic for that. And so they don't have to use the market rates that the rough order magnitude tool generates. But uh, that's worth mentioning. Uh, but typically, that only makes uh, when we have a situation where a lessor is already not wanting to play ball with the market. You know that that our anticipated lease savings are even less in those scenarios. Great. A uh, couple more questions in the queue, but you know we do have some more time parceled out for this session, um, and we do have Julie and Garrett for half hour to 45 minutes more if we need them. So please do uh, pop any more questions into the chat if you have them. And again, if you have a more specific or detailed question, uh, we will probably take that offline and do a little bit of due diligence before uh, responding to that one. Uh, we do have a question about. Uh, how the tool is used in situations when there's no uh, REIS, REIS, or CDRE data for av available for a location. Great question. And so that, that happens quite often. And so then we've got the ability to override the rates based on uh, information that's known. So if it's a non-REIS or non-CBRE market, which happens a lot to us, uh, the, the GSA team can help provide rates to use in that rough order magnitude estimate. All right, great. Uh, and so we have a question here also about, um, let's see, I'll just read it off here. So with a new smaller footprint for offices and cubicles, uh, how is that considered when, uh, when you're looking whether to move or to just uh, replace the existing furniture? So that's a good question, and, uh, you know, it's – Smaller footprint for offices, assuming the number of people is staying the same, means you're going to need less space. So then that kind of gets back into that question that Julie addressed a little bit earlier, where you know when when we start having to do significant renovations to the existing space, it really deflates the uh, the cost savings or potential cost savings to staying in place. Uh, so that you know using less space per person, getting new furniture in there, being able to shrink down by call it. 10, 20, 30 percent, whatever it may be, that's going to start poking holes in the in the cost savings argument, which is once again the one we use 95 percent of the time. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you, you just mentioned Julie. We haven't heard from her in a while. This question, I think, came in during her portion of the presentation, so I don't know who is uh, who is the, the more appropriate person to address it. Um, but this is about when a building manager might be getting involved in uh, a tenant's need or uh, in, in the process. Um, if you're renewing a lease and then, for example, there are above standard services, do they get rolled into the lease or, um, you know, how is that handled? Well, we actually do have the ability to uh, roll above standard services into the lease now. We did issue a leasing alert that allows us, if it's, if it's recurring, 
if it's recurring above standard services, above standard HVAC, we can roll that into the, into the lease now. So um, we can take that into account and put that into the operating rent. So that's, um, that's something we issued last year. So uh, that's something. Now, again, we definitely reach out to our field office managers at the expiration of the lease. Um, that's something that I think uh, Garrett showed as part of that, um, the latter part of this uh, tool. We reach out to them and say, okay, are there any due diligence issues that we need to be aware of? And that is something we'd want to take into account. So we definitely want to make sure that's in, that's in the rent and taken into account in, when, we, when, we, when we do our analysis. So I don't know if that answers the question, but we, we definitely would want to put that into, into the rental rate rather than issuing, rather than yeah. doing um, RWAs every year. It's more efficient that way. Um, so I, I did say I don't want to get too personal with some of these questions, but we do have some similar questions coming in, and maybe you can talk big picture about the, the process. Um, and so that, you know, what if an agency doesn't believe that a location is in a desirable area? Uh, what if the selected property does not, in the agency's eyes, meet security requirements? Can you, can you talk a little bit about how those decisions are made and the conversations between GSA and uh, customers in, in these types of situations? Um, Julie, I can start and field that, and then you can jump in and correct me if I misstate you, anything. If you're comfortable with that, you, you, you can you can start, and we'll see what we can do. We can tag team it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So so these are these are challenging. These are very challenging and uh, kind of specific questions. Uh, you know, if if a property is in a an undesirable area, uh, you know, the, the question goes back to mission. You know, we're the we're the government. We're not private industry. We can't pick and choose exactly where we want based on you know, the nicest part of town kind of thing. Uh, so there's a lot of situations where we end up in kind of less desirable areas. In fact, uh, Executive Order 12072 requires us to give first consideration to downtown areas, and in many cases those aren't exactly desirable areas. So that's just a decent example of sometimes that we run into uh, kind of legal legal issues when we're trying to pick a, pick a spot. So we have to make sure that we're tying everything back to the agency mission, and if the mission cannot be conducted or cannot be successfully conducted in a given area, you know, we need to know why it needs to be tied back to the mission. It could, it, but uh, generally speaking, a, a less than desirable area is a very challenging thing to, to deal with. Um, yeah. When, in, when a property doesn't meet security requirements, uh, you know, I, I guess that one gets pretty nuanced and pretty specific pretty quickly, but uh, I'll I'll jump on an example of uh, you know may, maybe this agency has been in that space for a long long time 40 years um, and now we've got the the opportunity to do a new lease for them and now we're trying to uh, you know the, the agency's security requirements are very different now than they were back then it's been upgraded a little bit over time but uh, you know it's going to be substantial remodeling that's going to have to go into place to to get that to get that build out up to snuff for today's security standards so we would be able to take that in in some in some manner or another into our rough order magnitude uh, cost benefit analysis and and try and you know properly assess that we're going to have higher than expected costs uh, to stay in place but then also if we have to rebuild everything you know it's it's one of those situations where we're going to have to spend money in both places where is it going to hurt more and that's what the cost benefit yeah. analysis is meant to assess. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And again, security can be, it, it depends what you mean by security too. I mean, security could be, is it an undesirable area? Is it that the building itself may have security, you know, facility security countermeasure issues? Or is it security, you know, in, in what sense? Or is it security because you're a law enforcement client and there's security issues because of the nature of, of, of the job that you do? And there's security concerns, whether whether because of you need to protect uh, the mission that you're doing, whether whether it's um, counterintelligence or whether um, uh, you're concerned about informants or anything like that. You know, security could be could mean so many different things, and 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 the key to that is making sure that you're very clear in how that's how that's described in your special requirements. And I, that kind of gets back to my thing about making sure that it's not arbitrarily. Uh, applied, that it's very clear, and that it's enforceable. Uh, we don't have a protest in it, so it's it's and, and that we work with your with your our customer engagement folks and and our and our and our planning folks to make sure that we articulate this to the market in a very clear way. So it is a challenge, though. I know we've been having challenges in this um, uh, across the country, and 
and as and as Garrett said, when it comes time, when it comes to maybe areas of town, we we can't always be in the in the in the swankiest part of town where we want to be, because um, we're not like we're not we're not we're not like the private sector. So. All right. Um, could we talk just a minute about um, full and open competition? Someone wrote in with, with kind of a question that might spark some conversation. The example here, let's say an incumbent lessor is, is being unreasonable, undefined, but as you indicated, then we go uh, do full and open competition. Can you exclude a lessor from future award because their proposed rates at the time of analysis are much higher than market? How would that something like that factor into the full and open competition process? Julie, well, hopefully, you want me to but at that one. Well, we'll we'll go, we'll we'll go right ahead. Go right ahead. <laughs> um, I w so short answer is no. You just because uh, we an incumbent lessor forces us to go full and open competition because they're they're giving us high rates doesn't mean we can exclude them from the full and open competition. Uh, but if they continue in during that full and open competition, assuming we get substantial competition, say we get ten different offers and that lessor comes in at the high end and we're working through the procurement, we end up setting a competitive range and the incumbent lessor does not make it in that competitive range because of their unreasonably high offer, then in that case they could be eliminated at that point in the procurement. And Julie, feel free to jump in there. No, that's, that's exactly right. At the end of the day, they're going to they're gonna throw themselves out by, in the competition by coming up with an unreasonable rate. Let, let the competition do do our work for us. So so what you're saying job. is if, uh, if if the three of us are racing in a hundred yard dash and I come in third, I don't get to win. Yeah. Thank you. Right. I believe that would happen. <laughs> I'll bet that in my um, we have a, a question about that. At what point in the process would it be best to request the RMO report? Is that at the beginning or after open market uh, information has been requested? Oh, so, so this would be right in the very beginning when you're working through and talking about requirements with your planning manager. That's the most common time that this would be done. I do want to reiterate that this is not uh, a mandatory for GSA or anyone within GSA to do. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of areas, there's a lot of markets that we're we're very familiar with in different regions that we we just don't have great success negotiating uh, with incumbents or others in full open competition situations. Uh, so you know, it's not unlikely that you're going to receive some pushback and say, "Hey, I need your I need your requirements for full open competition." Uh, that's just that's you know that's within the contracting officer's uh, realm to request. And I know that's a challenging answer to give. Uh, but bad news is not like fine wine. It does not get better with age. So, uh, you know, this is not – the rough order magnitude tool and the, the succeeding lease analysis is not mandatory. Uh, but I do think that, you know, you'll find it being used more and more as, as time goes on. Here. Great. All right. Uh, I have another question here. Sorry, I'm just uh, pulling it up on my screen. So this is an interesting question. So we we had talked earlier that we are we are looking, um, you know, three uh, thirty six months, three years, sort of uh, th thirty six to forty eight months ahead in advance, um, trying to avoid you know the, these incumbents with higher rates going to the full and open competition. Um, it's kind of a, a general question, I guess, about leasing is you know how can we secure new rates and lock them in three years ahead. Uh, of the time, assuming that the lessor won't change their mind when the lease comes around into the final year or something like that. Um, what what do we put into place that, you know, we're working so far in advance, um, how can we make sure that once that lease kicks in, we are getting the rate that we had negotiated and the, the rate that's the best? That's actually a really good question, and, it, and it's going to give me the ability to kind of uh, poke at a few different things. So. You know, if we're working so far in advance, how does that benefit us? Well, it, it does in a couple ways. Uh, we actually have the ability where, in, in some scenarios, if we're working on a succeeding lease and we can really we move we move faster with our procurement than, and we're not close to the expiration date, we could actually write a superseding lease uh, that would that would predate the termination of the existing lease and keep keep the customer in that particular location. So far, these are pretty rare because we have an excessive workload and everybody's super busy. So what that does is we get the closer and closer we get to the current expiration date, 
the less the less benefit or the less uh, pressure we have on the incumbent because once we get three months, six months from the expiration date of the lease, they know that we're not moving anywhere. So they know that if we they play leverage. hardball with us, you're right, exactly. We lose leverage big time. So uh, oftentimes that's when we start running into the issues. If we don't get out of it out far enough in advance of the current expiration date, we start having problems negotiating with the incumbent lessor. And the closer, the longer that drags out, the closer we get to that expiration date, the less leverage we have. And the more often that we have to go full and open competition, which also requires an extension, uh, which those extensions typically come at a premium too. So we're really trying to back up and get, you know, get further away from these lease expiration dates uh, to give ourselves more leverage and more time to, to complete these deals. So then, you know, best case scenario, we, we're looking at doing a succeeding lease. We could actually write a superseding lease for 15, 20 years, and uh, everything works out perfect. Uh, but then we could also sign a contract, uh, you know, a year out from the from the lease expiration, and set the effective date for the day after the current lease expiration. So the contract's already signed, it's already negotiated, it's already a done deal. So then we write out our time in our current lease. It expires. The new one automatically becomes effective when we continue our happy days. Uh, so that, those are two different scenarios that hopefully answer that question. That's right. That, 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 that's a good point. At the end of the day, the whole idea is we're not waiting to the end of the lease to sign the contract. We get the lease signed, and once it's signed, they have the obligation. You know, we have the obligation to pay the rent. But they have the obligation to accept that rent that they've agreed to. So, um, we talked a little bit about security. We talked a little bit about location. Uh, we do have a question about seismic, and I understand that this might not. Uh, be on top of everyone's mind, but I think this customer is coming from a place where, where seismic considerations are very important. Do you know or can you share how um, a building seismic security or just generally location seismic activity factors into any sort of lease location decision? I'll have to double check that, but um, I do know that's one of the things we would look at as part of the due diligence to make sure that buildings would be would um, would meet seismic compliance, and I'm pretty sure we want to make sure that they were seismic compliant before we decided to do a succeeding lease. You can double check that if I'm right on that. Um, if I'm right on that, Garrett, but I'm pretty sure we want to make sure they're seismic compliant. I want to maybe do a quick little check on my leasing desk guide, uh, and I'll, I'll reconfirm that and put that in writing in the answer for in writing. Uh, and that's, and that's why we buy sure on that. Time, that we uh, yeah, sorry, we, that, we that, that policy is. So I didn't know if you knew that off the top of your head. But, I thought uh, I thought I knew that. The more I thought about it, because I'm pretty sure we'd want to make sure that the that the new that the that that the that the building if they weren't seismic compliant, we would go full and open, or require mm -hmm. that right. they, yeah, require that they be seismic compliant. And that is one of the the qualitative things that we have, that's on the checklist is seismic safety. Um, you know, in Hawaii, I think was the example that was given. I'm not familiar with that market. Unfortunately, I've never had the uh, the pain and suffering that that have to do a market survey in Hawaii or anything. I'm, I've always hoped for that, but never gotten there. Um, but you know, if if the incumbent location is not seismic rated for what it needs to be, then we would look at the market and we would likely go full and open competition. But if we found no other no other buildings in that area that if we couldn't get a building that was seismic rated like we needed, I think that would put us in a different pickle, which could allow us to stay in place. But I think that would be, um, uh, I guess, kind of a, a pretty rare situation. But I'm happy to travel down there and check it out anytime. Here we go. If, if, if you need a guide, I'm, I'm all in on that with you. Um, all right, we have another question. Is, is there a uh, process flow chart available on our succeeding lease uh, procurement process that we can share? Is that, has anything been mapped out like that? I oh, think yeah. that we, the leasing desk guide is probably the best, best place for them to go for that. Would you agree, Julie? Yes, and there's a nice little flow chart on that. There's a lovely little flow chart that talks. That's on that tech. That's in that desk guide. Yes. Excellent. And, so I, and got, I know if you just go to gsa.gov and hit, yeah, if you just search leasing desk guide on gsa.gov, it, it'll take you right there. And we can certainly include a link directly to the leasing desk guide uh, in some of our post uh, post session materials. Perfect. So. 
We're, we're, we're sort of winding down some of the, the questions in the chat. Um, like I said, if you want to take advantage, you have us for, for a few more minutes here. Um, but you can always look online, www.gsa.gov slash CES is where we are going to post all of the information related to this session. Um, that is where we'll have the Q&A, we will have the session recording, and things like that. So um, I've vamped for a little bit here, but uh, I don't know, Julie and Garrett, is there anything more after hearing these questions and the conversation we've had today that you want to share or some more information? Um, you can certainly plug your appearance in, on uh, June 6th here in Washington, D.C., but uh, if there's anything else, I'll give you a couple moments to, to close out, and then I'll, I'll finish the day here. Okay. Actually, I, I hear, here I, I have the answer in seismic. There we go. Here we go. I mean, if it's a link, you can, we can put it right in the uh, in the chat. Oh, you're gonna share your screen even better. Let's see. Let's see. Let me see if I can here. Let me, let me see if I can put this in the thing. Can I put this in the thing or? Yeah, if it's a link, you can go ahead and put it right in the chat. I put a link in the chat. I don't know if I, I, I probably, it, the link would be quite to the whole leasing desk guide. That won't help. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The easiest way to get to the leasing desk guide is either go to gsa.gov and search leasing desk guide or yeah. just Google GSA leasing desk guide. Yeah. Our links are really long. Yeah, and, the, and I say it takes you to the whole desk guide, which is 400 pages, and that's not going to really help people. So I'll just give the yeah. I'll, so what I'll do is I'll, we'll just give him give we'll just give him the answer, and it's not it's not a it's not a simple answer. So we'll have to put it in writing. It's basically no, it's it basically possible. goes back to RP six, not RP eight. If it if it met RP six, so it's kind of an odd answer. That's why that's why I suddenly realized. Wait a minute. It's it's not. It's suddenly realized. Wait a minute. It's not a simple answer. And I and I thought I knew it was a simple answer. And that's why I went for it. And I went. Oh wait a minute. Get get. Abort, abort, I didn't know the right answer. <laughs> I have to go to the leaving desk guide <laughs> as I started answering the question. Oh, well. Um, I did, I did okay. see one question come in, and, and possibly we can, we can address this, and, and possibly maybe we'll have to get back to this person who's asking again. Sort of, I think it, it, it's a bit of a personal question, but I think it's a general question that everybody feels, um, and it's about funding. Uh, what should the process be when our agency reroutes all of our funding, leaving no funds available for move or build out? So I don't know if that's something we can necessarily address. I do know that, you know, with regard to our FIT program, the Furniture and IT program does allow for um, some creative financing solutions specific to consolidation projects if you're reducing your space. Um, but I don't know, uh, Julie or Garrett, if, if you know of anything that we can talk about that would uh, help ease the pain of, of limited to no funding for moving or for uh, build out right at the, the, when you're looking for a new lease there. Sure, that's a, that's a challenging question and one that we run into relatively often. Um, basically, the, the lack of agency funding or the rerouting of agency funding doesn't really change the way that GSA is required to procure space. Uh, so we can't, you know, the, the lack of funding, we've got a whole, I think there's a whole separate CES session on that actually uh, that, that deals with those type things. But, but honestly, you know, there, like you were describing a minute ago, there's some GSA tools and opportunities where we could provide financing, uh, but then nothing, nothing about agency funding or the lack thereof really precludes us or gives us the ability to avoid any kind of FAR or GSAM regulations. That's right. And it's 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 a tough answer, you know, and it's a hard one to give. But yeah. So I am I am I am reminded that you know if you go back uh, just a couple of months in the client enrichment series, you will find that we did a deep dive on GSA's consolidation fund program, uh, which might not be the magic bullet you're looking for, but does offer agencies funding to assist with again projects that are consolidating space not specific to move, not specific to furniture, but uh, perhaps if you're saving money or getting some uh, 
some money up front to help with the consolidation of space, you can free up some funds to uh, fund that move or to, to fund that furniture. Um, so it, it, there are some stipulations to that. I believe you have to be reducing space, you have to be doing some other things, but uh, that's worth looking into. And I'm pretty sure that that consolidation fund process for FY19 is open right now. Okay. That's all I've got. All Maybe right. So I think with that, I do see people typing. What I'm going to do is encourage people to, to type into the chat. And like I said, we're going to do some due diligence on uh, these responses, and we will be sure to turn around a comprehensive Q&A in the near future to you. And if you are in the Washington, D.C. area or can get to the Washington, D.C. area, you can come to the PBS Customer Forum on June 6th, uh, and you can ask and even answer some of these questions and impress all of your peers by looking as though you yourself are an expert in the tool. Um, so I do want to thank uh, Julie and Garrett for your time today. I think this was a great presentation with a lot of very good questions. I also want to thank all of our customers who uh, were able to join us today. I was looking. We had, uh, I think, close to 300 at some point on the phone. Uh, so that, that's great, and I hope that we were able to help you. You know, as, as we've been talking about through here, we are going to be turning around a completed FAQ document. We are going to be sharing uh, a recording of the session and some other ancillary materials, and we will get that out to all of our registered attendees today so you have that information on hand. You can also go online to www.gsa.gov slash CES. That is where we archive all of our client enrichment series information, uh, including this one and others. Um, if you're interested in learning more uh, about Client Enrichment Series presentations, visit that website. You're welcome to join us on Tuesday, June 11th. We will be doing a deeper dive into uh, some subject matter related to eReta for the RWA process. And then on Thursday, June 27th, uh, we are going to have, if you're wondering what eReta is, an eReta overview class. Uh, so this next month, the advanced class is before the beginner class, but uh, you're welcome to attend one or both of those sessions by going online and registering at www.gsa.gov slash CES. I want to remind everybody that the goal of the Client Enrichment Series is to engage our audience in workplace topics that can contribute to your mission success and to your effective management of your real estate and workplace programs. Um, you will be receiving, with all the materials after this uh, session today, a survey link. Please use the, that survey to tell us what you liked, what you want to see more about the Client Enrichment Series. We really do respond to the people who write in and try and tailor all of our presentations to make sure that uh, your needs are being met. So one more time, I do want to thank both of our presenters today. I want to thank Andrea and everybody else who was working behind the scenes to make this run smoothly and to all of our customers. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.